All right, everyone, welcome back. We are now in chapter nine, muscle tissue. This is the first of three or four lectures that we will cover for muscle. After muscle, as we said, the rest of this unit and really the rest of the semester will fall back and cover more of the nervous system. But we will see over the next few lectures that muscle system and nervous system really do have a lot in common. So make sure to brush up on things like action potentials from the previous lectures if you are still a little bit hazy on that material. But as always, let's go ahead and get started with our not really attendance questions, just a couple this time. First, what does it mean if a protein has quaternary structure? And next, what type or types of muscle tissue are voluntary? Go ahead and pause the video, try to answer those questions, and then check your answers. Okay, hopefully you've done that. So let's see what the answer is for each of these. What does it mean if a protein has quaternary structure? Well, remember when we were building proteins way back in chapter three, we start with amino acids and the sequence of amino acids we call the primary structure. At this point, it was not a protein. It was something that we call a polypeptide or a peptide chain. Then as those amino acids start interacting with each other and with their environment, they start to fold up and take some twists or zigzag patterns. We call that the secondary structure. And then those secondary structures begin to interact with each other and their environment. And we fold up and take on an actual three dimensional shape. This is the tertiary structure. And this is when we actually have a full protein. All proteins have a primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. But some proteins will actually bind with other proteins to form bigger complexes. And in the case when this happens, we say that the protein has quaternary structure. Not all proteins have that, but it's very common. For example, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is made of multiple proteins stuck together, so hemoglobin has a quaternary structure. Okay, next, which type or types of muscle tissue are voluntary? That means which ones do we have control over? The ones that we think about moving, like when we're writing notes or raising our hand or walking down the hallway or turning our head to look at something. Those are skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscle tissue is voluntary, and those are the muscles that we are going to primarily focus our study on in this chapter. There is also cardiac muscle and smooth muscle. We will briefly talk about those right at the beginning and right at the end, but again, the majority of this chapter is going to be focused on skeletal muscle. So let's go ahead and dive in to our muscle coverage. First, we're going to begin with the characteristics of muscle tissue. And this really pertains to all muscle, but again, we're focusing on skeletal muscle. So what are some common characteristics of muscle tissue? First, we say they are excitable or they have excitability. And that means that they respond to some sort of stimulus. We're going to be talking about electrical stimulus or action potentials. When an electrical stimulus is applied to a muscle, it's going to respond to it. And in a couple more lectures, we're going to see that the way that it responds is with contractility. It's going to contract. Contractility means that it is going to shorten. Muscle well, skeletal muscle that we're studying, is made of long fibers. And when an electrical stimulus is applied to those muscles, those fibers are going to shorten because they have contractility. They shorten in response to a stimulus. 
Muscle tissue also has extensibility. That means it can be stretched. Now, obviously, it can be stretched too far. We've heard of torn muscles. But without tearing them, we can still stretch muscles. Muscle fibers can be stretched. They have extensibility. And finally, elasticity. If we stretch a muscle because of its extensibility, it will also snap back to its original length because it has elasticity. So what are the functions of muscle? There's a bunch of different functions. Here, we're gonna be talking about they produce movement. Everything in your body that moves is moving as a result of muscles. Now, it doesn't matter what type of movement it is. If it is moving, it is moving because of muscle. Muscles are also responsible for posture. Whether it be good posture or bad posture, that is because of muscles. When we stand upright, the muscles in our legs, the muscles in our back, the muscles in our neck, the muscles in our abdomen, they're all working to provide posture. Now, posture is important. It is important to stand upright, not slouch. And that's because if we are slouched over and we're looking like a cashew sitting in our chair, the muscles are not holding us upright and the result is the organs in our abdomen are not in their correct position. So things are not moving properly. Our lungs are being kind of compressed so we can't breathe properly. Some blood vessels may be getting kind of distorted so blood can't flow properly. So posture is more than just appearance. Posture is important physically for making sure that all of our other organs can perform their job well. Next, stabilization. Here, similar to posture, this is actually related to joints. For example, our knee. Our knee is surrounded by muscles and a lot of those muscles are there keeping the three bones, well four if you count the patella, that make up our knee joint, our femur, our tibia, our fibula, keeping them all kind of held in place. If it wasn't for muscles, we would very quickly topple. And finally, heat production. We talked about this all the way back in the first or second lecture of the semester when we were talking about feedback loops and homeostasis. Remember, every time a muscle contracts and relaxes, contracts and relaxes, as in with shivering, but even if it's on a smaller scale, every time a muscle contracts and relaxes, it's using ATP. And when that happens, energy is going to be created. Think back to cellular respiration. Every time we generate a molecule of ATP to replace some ATP that was just used, heat is a byproduct. So just kind of a very, very quick, very brief detour moving away from skeletal muscle, a little bit about smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is one of the two types of muscle that is involuntary, the other being cardiac. Smooth muscle is found in hollow body areas, such as our digestive tract. But let's see a little bit about smooth muscle. First, smooth muscle is responsible for opening and closing body openings. There's a type of muscle called a sphincter, which is a ring of smooth muscle. They're found all through our digestive tract. They open to allow something to pass through. They close to block passage. Sphincters are also found in our capillaries. They open and close to allow or prevent movement of blood into the capillaries. Also, our pupils in our eyes. The dilation and constriction of pupils to allow more or less light in is because of smooth muscle activity. Body hair positions. Remember the erector pili muscles. 
those are smooth muscles. When your hair stands on end, if you get a cold chill or if you're scared or something like that and your hair stands on end, that's because of smooth muscle. So that's all we'll talk about smooth muscle for right now, but like I said, at the end, we do come back and we talk a little bit more about smooth muscle and cardiac muscle. So let's begin with talking about the gross anatomy of skeletal muscle. Gross anatomy, remember, doesn't mean ooh yuck. It means big enough to be seen without the use of any sort of instruments, big enough to be seen with the naked eye. So when we're talking about a muscle, first thing, this is an organ. A muscle is an organ, and most of them are rather big. So if we talk about a muscle, we're talking about something like the bicep brachii or the bicep of your arm or the tricep brachii, the tricep of your arm, the deltoid in your shoulder, something like that. One whole muscle is innervated or served by one nerve. Now this does not mean one neuron. Remember a nerve is a collection of neuron axons. So one nerve has a lot of neurons in it but one nerve provides electrical activity to one muscle. One muscle is supplied by one artery. One artery brings blood carrying oxygen and nutrients to a muscle. And then veins, there is always at least one vein, sometimes there is more than one vein, that carries blood away from the muscle. Now in the image here, we're seeing a uh, micro anatomy. So even though we're talking gross anatomy, this is probably right at the edge of what can be seen with the naked eye. But what we're seeing here is a muscle and we're seeing the blood vessels in that muscle. And at first glance, it might look like something's wrong because these blood vessels are pretty uh, kind of convoluted. They're folded back and forth. They're almost twisted looking, but that's actually a really good thing. This is what we want to see when we look at blood vessels in a skeletal muscle. And think about why that might be. Why would blood vessels in a skeletal muscle look like that? Well, remember, contractility, extensibility, and elasticity. Muscles are constantly elongating or shortening, elongating or shortening. So think about what the blood vessels need to do. They need to be able to stretch out or shorten, stretch out or shorten, but they can't do that because even though they have a little bit of smooth muscle in them, mostly they are not muscular tissue. They are various types of epithelial tissue and connective tissue. So to allow for that extensibility and contractility, they're kind of coiled up like a spring so that it's as if they are being stretched. So let's talk about muscle itself and look at the structure of a muscle. And what we see here is a muscle. This is a muscle, it looks like a muscle of the thigh, and what we have done here is we have cut across the muscle. We've cut across the muscle, and now we are looking at the interior of that muscle. Over here on the left, we've got an artist rendering. Over on the right, this is an actual photograph of the inside of a muscle. So when we look at muscle, we will notice pretty quickly that there are repeating units inside the muscle at every level. So each of those levels is surrounded by some connective tissue. So we're going to start looking at the big picture and gradually get smaller. And then we're going to do the same thing in reverse. We're going to start with the small and work our way bigger. So we take a muscle and some muscles are bigger than others, but they're all going to have the same features. So this, even though it's showing a muscle in the thigh, this could be a muscle of the face, a muscle of the arm, a muscle in a toe, it could be whatever. 
they're all going to have the same structure. When we look at a muscle, it's going to be wrapped with a connective tissue sheath called the epimyceum. The epimyceum. So one root word that we're going to be seeing a lot of is MYS. We will also see something SARC, SARC. So MYS and SARC, SARC, both mean muscle. And epi, remember, means on the surface of or above. So the epimyceum is on the surface of an entire muscle. The epimyceum is a connective tissue sheath that wraps around a whole muscle. And when we cut the muscle and we look inside that epimyceum, the muscle itself has these little individual packets or units. And these individual units are called fascicles. Fascicles. And if we were to pull one of these fascicles out, which is what we've done right here, this fascicle is actually the length of the entire muscle. One fascicle is as long as the muscle that it is inside of. And the fascicle is surrounded by another one of those connective tissue sheaths or membranes called the perimyceum. Peri means around. The perimyceum is around the fascicle of a muscle. And if we look inside of a fascicle, we will see that there are smaller units still. These smaller units are called muscle fibers. Muscle fibers. And a muscle fiber, two things to note here. One is it is as long as the fascicle that it is inside of. And since we said a fascicle is as long as the muscle that it is inside of, that means that a muscle fiber is as long as the muscle that it is inside of. Well, the other thing to know about a muscle fiber is a muscle fiber is a muscle cell. A muscle fiber is the same thing as a muscle cell. It looks really different from the other cells in the body. They are very long, they are very straight, they are very smooth, but they are cells. So a muscle fiber is surrounded by something called an endomyceum. An endomyceum. So the muscle fiber or individual muscle cell is surrounded by an endomyceum. Several of those muscle fibers or muscle cells together are surrounded by a perimyceum to make a fascicle. And several fascicles together are surrounded by an epimyceum to make a whole muscle organ. All right, so we're going to now take a look at this muscle fiber in just a few more slides. Right now, kind of keep all of that in mind, and we're going to come back in just a little bit and talk about individual muscle fibers. But here, we're going to talk a little bit more about the whole muscle, the muscle itself. Now we've moved up into the arm. But again, this could be anywhere in the body. We're still going to see some of the same features. It looks like we are maybe looking at part of the biceps brachii here. A couple of terms. First, origin and insertion. Origin and insertion are where muscles attach to bones. Origin and insertion are where muscles attach to bones. 
The difference is the origin is where a muscle attaches to the bone that does not move when it contracts. Origin is where the muscle attaches to the bone that does not move when that muscle contracts. I see now that it said this is the brachialis, not the biceps brachii. Okay, then at the other end, the insertion, the insertion is where the muscle attaches to the bone that does move when the muscle contracts. So when the brachialis contracts, what happens? The forearm moves upward. So we, what we actually say is the brachialis has flexed the arm. Something that we learned in lab was flex means to decrease the angle of the joint. The opposite is extend. Muscles on the back of the arm, when they contract, they extend the arm. They increase the angle of the joint. So origin, muscle attaches to the bone that does not move. Insertion, muscle attaches to the bone that does move. Now there can be more than one origin. There can be more than one insertion. But the origin does not move. The insertion does. So how do muscles attach to bones? They can be directly or indirectly attached. A direct attachment means that the muscle itself attaches to the bone. We'll talk about how in just a moment. The indirect attachment uses either a tendon or an aponeurosis. They are pretty much the same thing, but a tendon or an aponeurosis is not muscle itself. It is connective tissue that extends from one end of the muscle and attaches to the bone. First, let's talk about the difference between tendons and aponeuroses, and then we will talk about the difference between uh, direct or indirect attachments and how they attach to the muscle and the bone. So tendons are kind of like cords or ropes. Aponeuroses are like sheets. So here we see a tendon in the arm. An example where we would see an aponeurosis is on the forehead at the frontalis. So the frontalis has a muscular area that goes across the forehead, but if we were to follow it up into the scalp, it has a very flat connective tissue that serves the same purpose as the tendon. It anchors the frontalis muscle to the bone of the skull. Tendons are more like a rope or a, a, a cable or something like that. Aponeurosis is more like a sheet. But both of them, whether it is a direct attachment or an indirect tendon or aponeurosis, think back to the structure of the muscle that we saw here. The muscle is covered by an epimyceum. The epimyceum is if a tendon or an aponeurosis is present, the epimyceum is continuous with the tendon or the aponeurosis. And then the epimyceum, the tendon, the aponeurosis, whatever it happens to be there, is also continuous with that membrane that surrounds a bone. Remember the membrane that surrounds a bone was called a periosteum periosteum. So we have a membrane around the bone, the periosteum, a membrane around the muscle, the epimyceum, and they are continuous with each other. There may be a tendon or an aponeurosis along the way, which is also continuous with both of them. So one single membrane is wrapped around the bone, wrapped around the tendon, wrapped around the aponeurosis, wrapped around the muscle, they are just given different names based on where they are. 
but because we have this very tough connective tissue, everything being continuous makes it very easy for everything to stay in place and to transfer that movement energy. <clears throat> so we're now getting smaller. Again, let's go back to, I said, keep this muscle fiber in mind. So now we've taken this muscle fiber, we've pulled it forward in the fascicle so that we could see that fiber or that cell, but let's go ahead and pull it the rest of the way out. And that's what we have here at the top, the muscle fiber or the muscle cell. Here, we can see that it is a very long cell. A muscle cell is as long as the muscle that it is in. There are muscles that run from your upper hip down to your knee joint. And the muscle cells inside of that muscle are that long. And they are multinucleated. Remember, we saw that in lab. We talked about it back in chapter four. And it's interesting because they don't start out multinucleated. In fact, they start out as a lot of individual cells each with one nucleus, but during embryonic development, those cells fuse with each other. It becomes one cell, but the nuclei don't go anywhere. They all stay in place. So we end up with one really long cell that has a lot of nuclei. And we will see that just like we saw with neurons, and they were very highly specialized, they had a lot of features that were you know, unique to neurons, we're going to see here, there are a lot of features unique to muscle cells. And just like we saw with neurons, we're going to see that a lot of the features that are in pretty much every cell, they are given names that are a little bit different when we talk about them in a muscle cell. For example, the plasma membrane, the cell membrane, of a muscle cell is called a sarcolemma. A sarcolemma. And a sarcolemma is a plasma membrane or a cell membrane. So let's backtrack for a minute and tie some things together. This muscle cell that is pulled forward is surrounded by a sarcolemma. But going around the outside of the sarcolemma is our endomyceum. So if we started all the way down at the muscle cell level, we would have the muscle fiber or muscle cell surrounded by a sarcolemma, surrounded by an endomyceum, and then several of those together are surrounded by a perimyceum to make a fascicle and then several fascicles together surrounded by an epimyceum to make a whole muscle. So we're looking at this muscle fiber. And we said that muscle fiber is surrounded by a cell membrane that we call the sarcolemma. Now I'm going to change picture for just a moment to give us an idea of what the sarcolemma looks like and how it's very highly specialized. Here, up on the surface, this kind of dark purple area, that's the cell membrane. That's the sarcolemma. But we're looking at the inside of it. It's been cut and lifted up so that we're looking inside the cell. And we can see that the cell membrane has these extensions that run through the cell and wrap around some of these structures that are inside the cell. They form rings around it and then they travel down to the next one. We can't see, but it's forming a ring around it. And it travels down to the next one and it forms a ring around it. And if we could see the rest of this cell and the rest of the sarcolemma, that cell membrane, we would see that this kind of tube structure runs all the way through and out the other side connecting to the cell membrane on the other side. It's very hard to tell, but if we look at the plasma membrane or the cell membrane here, we can see these holes 
those holes are where these tubes enter. So these tubes, if we were to look at the inside of one of these tubes, like we see right here, well, that is cell membrane. It's like the cell membrane is squishy and someone pushed their finger down inside of it. And now that where we pushed in is traveling through the interior of the cell and ultimately out the other side. An extension of the cell membrane traveling all the way through the cell. Well, that extension is called a T-tubule, or it stands for transverse tubule. The cell membrane is pushed into the inside of the cell. So something traveling along the cell membrane might move into a T-tubule, travel all the way through, and could potentially come out the other side. That's going to be very important in our next lecture. So the sarcolemma is the cell membrane. The T-tubules are extensions of the sarcolemma that go into the inside of the cell. Well, remember the inside of any cell is called the cytoplasm. But inside of a muscle cell, it's called a sarcoplasm. Sarcoplasm is cytoplasm. It's just the cytoplasm of a muscle cell. Now, muscle cells use a lot of ATP. They are very, very active. Everything that's happening inside of them uses a lot of ATP. So, what do we need to make ATP? Well, we need glucose and we need oxygen. So, muscle cells need a lot of glucose and a lot of oxygen. They can get this from the blood, but if they are being really, really active, the blood might not be able to supply them quick enough. So muscle cells contain their own stores of glucose and oxygen. When we're not using muscle, we are filling them up with glucose, we are filling them up with oxygen. The glucose is packed together in structures that we call glycosomes. Glycosomes are clusters of glucose inside of a muscle cell. That way when the muscle cell needs glucose, it has a ready access because it's got those glycosomes there. Also, myoglobin. That should sound kind of familiar. Sounds a little bit like hemoglobin. And it is. Hemoglobin is the protein that allows our blood to carry oxygen. It holds on to oxygen. Well, myoglobin is a very, very similar protein that's found in our muscle cells. And it is a protein that holds on to oxygen. It's why our muscles are red. Myoglobin holds on to oxygen. Glycosomes are made of glucose. So now we've got the oxygen and the glucose that will be needed when those muscles become very active. Next, we're going to talk about the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, except in a muscle cell, it's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR. Now, in muscle cells, these are going to be really, really important organs. And because they are so important, they are very extensive. They run through the entire cell, wrapping around parts of the cell. And over here, it's the blue part that we see. It kind of forms a mesh that surrounds everything in the cell. Here in this image, it's this blue area that is surrounding everything in the cell. It's been cut away in some spots. That's just so that you can see what's underneath it. It's not because it's not there. But this is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the same thing as the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. 
But look here, right in the middle, it's kind of this web-shaped. But where it bumps up next to a T-tubule, it's more wide and broad and not really in those web-like filaments. This area of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right next to the T-tubule, where it gets this different shape, these are called terminal cisterni terminal cisterni this is part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum it's just shaped differently where it bumps up against a t tubule terminal cisterni now i'm going to give you another term here that isn't in this part of our outline but it will come up again so go ahead and make a note. Here we can see if we look at a T-tubule, this guy right here, we look at a T-tubule, it's got a terminal cisterni on one side and a terminal cisterni on the other side. So there are three things here, one T-tubule and two terminal cisterni. The three of them together are called a triad. A triad one T tubule and it's two adjacent terminal cisterni that's a triad that will come back up later in either this lecture or our next two lectures all right so now what we've done is we have taken one of these little packets that's inside of a muscle cell and we have pulled it forward. This is called a myofibril. To kind of orient you a little bit, let's go back to our big muscle. Here's our whole muscle. We see the uh, fascicles inside of it. We pull a fascicle out. We can see all of those muscle cells inside of it. We've pulled a muscle cell or a muscle fiber out, but we could see these other smaller units inside of it. Now what we're doing is we're at the microscopic level and we are going to pull one of these little structures out. By the way, that's these guys right here. We're going to pull one of these out. <clears throat> and that's what we see here. This is called a myofibril. Myofibril. And a myofibril is going to be made of individual proteins that work together. But if we look at a myofibril, we can see that different areas of it look pretty different. So we're going to spend the rest of this lecture talking about those different proteins in the different regions of a myofibril. So I'm actually going to jump around and maybe go in a little bit of a different order compared to how it's presented in your outline, but all of this, I'm just gonna kind of keep flipping back and forth between a few different pages of our PowerPoint here. So now I've taken out an isolated section and we're gonna talk about a couple of proteins. If we look at these different structures here. We can see one of them is pretty thick and the others are pretty thin. The red in this image is pretty thick and we call it a thick filament. The blue things are much thinner and we call them thin filaments. So thick filaments and thin filaments. Now let's talk about the thick filaments first. Thick filaments are made of a protein called myosin, down here on the bottom left. Myosin. Now, here's another drawing of myosin. Myosin is a protein that's got quaternary structure. We can kind of imagine myosin as two golf clubs and we've laid the golf clubs parallel to each other 
and somehow or another we've managed to twist the handles of the golf clubs together. And then at one end there's the heads of the golf clubs. So this is a myosin protein with its quaternary structure. But we go even further. We take this myosin and join many of them together. And that's what we have down here. This is our thick filament down at the bottom. And we don't just join them together any old way. The ones on the right side, see where it says bare zone here? If we look at everything to the right, those myosin proteins are like oriented what we see on the top of this image. Everything to the left of where it says bare zone these all have the heads down on the left side with the handles pointing towards the bare zone. And all together, this is a thick filament. This is myosin protein working together as a thick filament. That's what we see right here. This is the pink guy. Now, the myosin heads are all kind of sticking up all the way around each end of the thick filament. They're sticking up. But now if we look at the thin filaments, the thin filaments are primarily composed of a protein called actin. And that's what we see down here. Actin is actually a globular protein. One actin molecule looks like, I say it looks like a blueberry that's got a dimple in it. And a whole bunch of these actin subunits get stuck together and they form a string. And then there's another string. And those two actin strings or actin fibers get twisted around each other, kind of like a corkscrew. The other parts of that thin filament are two other proteins. One very long, stringy filament is called tropomyosin. Tropomyosin wraps around the actin, and it does it in a very, very specific way. If we look at the actin, we can see that all of those little dimples are pointed kind of outward. And the tropomyosin is lying along the actin fiber so that it is covering up those dimples. Those dimples are not exposed. Those dimples are act actually called active sites. The dimples are called active sites, and the active site is covered up by tropomyosin. We'll see why that's important in just a moment, but let's look at the other protein that's involved here called troponin. Troponin. Now troponin, or troponin, holds the tropomyosin in place. One end of the troponin is attached to the actin. The other end of the troponin is attached to tropomyosin. And the, tropo the tropomyosin is held in place by the troponin. And it holds it in place, covering up those active sites. So here is how the thick filaments and the thin filaments interact with each other at rest. We see one long thick filament. At each end, that thick filament is surrounded by thin filaments, which are anchored to something kind of like a wall on one end. And the same thing on the other end. The thick filament is surrounded by thin filaments that are anchored to a wall. Now, the thick filament, 
has more than two thin filaments on each end. We only see two just because it would get kind of cluttered, but think of these thin filaments all the way around the thick filament. But all of the thin filaments are anchored to this wall on this end, this wall on this end. Here we see the same kind of picture, just with different colors, different artist rendering. Here's our thick filament, mostly myosin. Here's our thin filaments, mostly actin. So now we're going to go back to our bigger structure that looks at the other parts of this myofibril. If we look at the thick filaments and the thin filaments, we can see there are some other things involved. Here at each end is that wall that we were talking about. That wall is called a Z-disc. And that's because if we look inside of it, there's this zigzag area. These are proteins. We don't need to worry about what those proteins are. We just call it a Z-disc. Up here in the image, we can see another Z-disc. The Z-disc is the wall that those thin filaments are attached to. Also, we see something that kind of looks like a spring that is attaching the thick filament to that wall. We don't see that up here in this image. It is there, we just don't see it in the image. That spring that is holding the thick filament to the wall is an elastic protein called titan. Titan holds the thick filament to the Z-disc. All right, so now we can see this entire structure, Z-disc, Titan, thin filaments, thick filaments, down at the other end, the same thing. The area from one Z-disc to the next Z-disc and all of the structures in between them is the unit of muscle called a sarcomere. A sarcomere is defined as the functional contractile unit of skeletal muscle. A sarcomere is defined as the functional contractile unit of skeletal muscle. And what we can see kind of in this image at the top is here we have one sarcomere and next to it we have another sarcomere. Next to it on the other side we have another sarcomere. I'm going to back up now in some of our images. Here we can see a sarcomere. We can see another sarcomere. But if we go back to the picture of the whole muscle even though we can't see all of the parts, we can see how parts of it are dark and parts of it are light and parts of it are dark and parts of it are light. Remember when we looked at a skeletal muscle under the microscope, what did we say that appearance was called? We said that it was striated. Why is it striated? Here we can see those striations in the artist rendering. Why is it striated? Because of the sarcomeres. Here, where we have the thick filaments, that's where it was dark. Then we have the thin filaments right here, that's where it was light, and it repeated. So, even though we said one muscle can be very long, and all of the fascicles inside of it are the same length as the muscle, and all of the muscle cells inside of that are the same length as the muscle and the fascicle. A sarcomere is very short, but they repeat one after another, after another, after another, 
the length of the entire muscle. Sarcomeres are very short, but they repeat end to end over and over. And they all have the same structure. So let's look to see what's going on with the different regions that we're looking at. We're going to talk about their names. First, the Z-disc is the starting point and ending point of a sarcomere. A sarcomere runs from one Z-disc to the next Z-disc in line. Same thing down here we see one Z-disc to the next Z-disc in line. Everything between it is a sarcomere. The Z-disc are what the fibers are attached to. Both the thick filaments and the thin filaments are attached to the Z-disc. Up here, if we look at the top, we can see that all of these red lines, those are the thick filaments. Those are those myosin filaments. Down here, we don't see a band, but if we go right here to right here, the length of the myosin within one sarcomere is the A band. The A band is the length of the myosin or the thick filaments of a single sarcomere. Over here we see something called the I band. We don't see that down here in the bottom picture. We see it up here in the top picture though. We see the I band. Over on the other side we see another I band. The I band is the space in between the thick filaments of one sarcomere and the thick filaments of the next sarcomere. So there are no thick filaments. There is no myosin in the I band area. The I band is between the thick filaments of adjacent sarcomeres. Well, similar to that, we have something called the H zone. The H zone. We don't see it down here at the bottom labeled, but it is right here. The H zone is the area between the thin filaments on each side of a single sarcomere. The H zone is the area between actin or thin filaments of a single sarcomere. Very, very similar running right down the middle of the sarcomere through the middle of the H zone are some proteins that run perpendicular to all of the other proteins here. This is called the M line or midline. The M line runs right down the middle of a sarcomere, perpendicular to the thick and thin filaments. It anchors the thick filaments in place. We will be coming back and talking more about this, but those are all of the parts of the sarcomere. Those are what the proteins are, what's found where, but we will be talking more about those. I do want to talk about one more thing, and that is how the proteins interact with each other. I made a big point to say these active sites of actin are covered up by the tropomyosin. There's a reason behind that, and that is because the myosin heads really, really like those active sites. And if those active sites were not covered up, these myosin heads would attach to them 
the, the end, the little curved part of the myosin head fits into that active site. Kind of like if you pushed your thumb into some wet clay and then took your thumb away, your thumb would fit right back in there really, really easily. The myosin heads want to fit into that active site, but the tropomyosin prevents it. If something happened and that tropomyosin were not there, if that active site was exposed, the myosin head would extend and attach itself into that active site. If that happened, the result is called a cross bridge. A cross bridge is when myosin heads extend and fit into attaching themselves to the active site of actin. Cross bridges occur when myosin heads extend and attach themselves to the active site of actin. We've already mentioned that titan is what that little springy protein was that holds the, the myosin, the thick filaments, in place. There is one more protein that is not shown in this image, and that is called dystrophin. Dystrophin is a protein that anchors all of these proteins that make up sarcomeres to the connective tissue of muscle. Because what we're going to see is the sarcomeres, we've already said that they are the contractile unit. It is these proteins that cause muscle contraction. But if they are not anchored to the connective tissue of the muscle itself, the muscle would never shorten, the muscle would never contract. It is dystrophin, a protein, that actually transfers the shortening movement of sarcomeres to the muscle itself. This should sound a little bit familiar because uh, most of us have heard of a disorder called muscular dystrophy. In muscular dystrophy, it is the dystrophin that has something going wrong with it. So if you ever hear muscular dystrophy, think dystrophin. So here is our thick filament and thin filament again. Now remember, if these little uh, myosin heads extended forward and attached to the actin, that would cause a cross bridge. Here is everything again. You do need to know the names of all the different zones and bands and what is or is not present because that will be the basis for how muscles actually contract, which we will cover in our next lecture, because now we are done with the anatomy portion. We will pick back up with the physiology portion in our next lecture. It's going to be a little bit extensive and you do want to have the action potential material fresh in your head, so it might be a good idea to rewatch that from neurons. And once we introduce action potentials again, we will see how those action potentials cause muscle contractions, excitability and contractibility or contractility. All right, take care everyone, and I will talk to you in the next lecture.